What's the word, y'all? NBA playoffs, man. I think we're all in that mindset. It's We got like a week left of the NBA regular season, and is everybody's thinking about seeding. Everybody's thinking about who's going to be the play-in matchups. And today, I'm doing something a little bit differently. You know what I'm saying? We got all but one postseason spot secured. We're still trying to figure out whether or not it's going to be the Spurs or the Lakers that take that 10 seed spot. Pretty much everybody else has been eliminated. It's oh, Okay. Technically, technically, as of right now as I record this video, the Sacramento Kings are still in the race but it's it's unlikely. They shut down Sabonis. They shut down De'Aaron Fox. But, I mean, uh, Off Night's been doing his thing. All but one spot has been secured, and I'm doing something that's maybe not the smartest thing as we keep thinking about the playoffs. I'm going to take some time to talk about the teams that are not in it. I guess I'm counting as nine teams because I don't want to talk about the Lakers or the Spurs because I'm not completely sure who's going to take that spot. So the nine teams there on the outside looking in because when I think about it, this might be the last opportunity we have to talk about them until we get to the offseason. We're going to talk about these teams heavily in the offseason because these are all our lottery teams. Who are they going to draft with their picks? Who's going to get number one? But I wanted to take some time to talk about them, and, and low-key is kind of stepping out of my comfort zone. So I listen to a podcast and it's kind of changed my perspective completely on work and everything. But on this channel, I, I find comfort in talking about things that I've seen and, and, and things that I know. But in the last month and maybe two, some of these teams have got close to zero. And I mean zero live watch time. Okay, that's an exaggeration because like, for example, uh, the Detroit Pistons were in a close game to the Brooklyn Nets like a week or so ago. I tuned in with like six minutes ago and watched it to the end and Kate Cunningham was taking over. But you couldn't, I couldn't tell you what happened in the first three and a half quarters. And it's pretty much the same across a lot of these teams. But I'm not completely void of like what's going on within the organizations because I feel like every single one of these teams have a few players on their organization or in their organization that I enjoy. So like, for example, I have not watched a lot of the Houston Rockets recently, but what I'll do is after their games, I go to NBA.com and I'll watch Jalen Green's possessions. I can watch every single time Jalen Green touched the ball in that game without watching a full 48 minute game and no that doesn't give me the full perspective of how these players are playing it's, it's serviceable enough as this team has won a total of 20 games so yeah some of these teams are get talked about a lot some of them not so much but hey I just want to talk about some of these teams that's after I talk about our sponsor which is of course prize picks they have been a presenting sponsor for the entirety of the regular season which is weird to say I feel like just yesterday we was doing our first read but they are still here for the now and for the playoffs hit that link in the description download the prize picks app and use code Kenny because they're matching all deposits for new players up to a hundred dollars join the thousands of people that are already use cocaine i love prize picks because it's just you versus the numbers you pick some of your favorite players and you decide whether you want to go over or under on their props and this has added another element for me as i watch this entire regular season i'm pretty much taking an over i'm an over guy it just gives me an extra element to root for players randomly and if you've been around since the beginning of the season you know that me and my homie started an entire league where we started off with 200 dollars on prize picks and we're trying to figure out who's gonna win the most well it was Hey, it was me, and it's not even its not even close. So hit that link in the description, download the Prize Picks app, and use code Kenny because they're matching all deposits up to $100. Shout out to Prize Picks for sponsoring. Let's get into the talk. Oh, one last thing before we get to actually talking about everything. I'm going to plug my, uh, my, my newsletter one more time. Well, not one more time because we're going to do it a lot. The Enjoy Basketball newsletter. It's kind of weird that we started like four days ago, officially launched like four or five days ago, and we already have like over 15,000 subscribers to the newsletter. So if you're missing out, hit that link in the description um, just in case you missed Saturday night's game or Sunday night's game. Game. We got some of the best writers in the game that's going to recap it and everything. So hit that link. I don't even know where I want to start. This is low-key a video I did that I had like a year or so ago, which is weird to say, but it's true. I wanted to talk about all the teams there on the outside looking in and the play-in, but I wanted to get an expert for all, the team, all these teams because like I said, some of these teams I don't watch nearly as, as much as the other ones. So I think I even got like proof of DMs of like Cone from last season. I wanted him to be my OKC expert. Give him 10 minutes where me and him just talk about OKC Thunder. Then we cycle through the next team and cycle through the next team and maybe we'll do something like that when the offseason comes around. I think I want to open up talking about the New York Knicks because out of all of the teams on the outside looking in, um, between them and the Portland Trailblazers, these are these are the most disappointing teams this season. The Portland Trailblazers kind of kind of have an excuse, having dealing with so many injuries, and then Dame got injured and they shut Dame down. The Knicks didn't go through that same thing. Of course, every team was banged up one way or another throughout the season, but the Knicks were a team that last season surprised the world, ended up being in the playoffs. Uh, the New York Knicks fans were going crazy. The guard was bumping, and this season was the exact opposite. And right now, they sit at a record of 10 games under 500, and that have been eliminated officially from the play-in race. And what happened this season for this to happen? I remember going to our podcast after the offseason, the free agency, and, and I was just telling people that I expected the New York Knicks to fall off a little bit. And I didn't think it was going to be today. 
this extent. I didn't expect them to miss the play-in completely, but I just I looked at what they did this offseason, which was like, bring back everybody that helped us do our thing this year and just add a few other pieces in Evan Fournier and Kemba Walker, but we going to run it back, and I just saw so many other teams in the conference add pieces to make them better, and I was just a little bit afraid that they didn't do enough to make them better, and I guess... I, I was right. They didn't do anything. And the Knicks are going through the Tom Thibodeau cycle, the same thing we saw here in Chicago, similar things we saw in Minnesota, where he gets the most out of his players, but it seems like there's a there's a clock on that thing. For the Bulls, it happened to be a couple seasons. For the Minnesota Timberwolves, it happened to be, I think, just one season, too. And this time, it was just one season. This was a team that was top 10, top 5 in defense for the entire year, and though they didn't make a lot of extreme personnel changes, they fell off completely from the defensive side of the ball. And I don't think I could talk about the Knicks falling off or, or their defense falling off without mentioning the name Julius Randle because, of course, Julius Randle was the most approved player of last year. Um, he ended up being an all-NBA player, and he was locked in on both sides of the ball that we've, like, we've never seen before. Basically, this season, he reverted back to the Pelicans version of Julius Randle, and I mean early Pelicans because I know he had that second-half stretch in his last year with the Pelicans where he was elite, or like the first-year version of, of him in the New York Knicks, and that's just not enough for them to do their thing. The body language from him completely changed he was all smiles I love New York and then at one point he was giving him a thumbs down and these are all reports so take it with a grain of salt but there was reports like a week or so ago that, that he might try to force his way out similarly to what James Harden did right this is a guy that you paid good amount of money to be your star player and just in one season has given him that paycheck things have gone south now the report is that they get to the locker room and he's completely secluded from the rest of his teammates just bad locker room etiquette and that can be a lot I mean when, when you look that to be the star player be the franchise guy at that point because that's what he was for the Knicks and all of the things changed that's a lot for the organization to deal with so I'm curious if, if Julius Randle does force his way out what is a return for the what is return for Julius Randle that will be good enough for the New York Knicks? Or is he a part of a bigger package? Is there a team out there that sees last year's version of Julius Randle be willing to take a chance and, and as the Knicks try to package this and some picks and some other assets to go above and beyond for some people that might be on the market? What we've seen from the Knicks under the Leon Rose era and the Leon Rose era is him being in the front office as they've been ultra conservative, which is, has not been a bad thing. But coming off a season like this, maybe it's time to put your foot on the gas just a little bit. If there's any bright signs from this entire season is that in the last couple weeks, Tom Thibodeau has, for the first time ever, by the way, has let the young guys play. And the young guys might not have won a bunch of I think they ended up going on like a five-game streak, low-key. They might not have won a ton of games, but they've been way more enjoyable to watch. And you're starting to see more of what R.J. Barrett can be if you allowed him to be your number one guy. Um, allowing R.J. to be your number one guy, of course, probably sets your organization back a little bit, right? Now, R.J. Barrett is your number one guy next season. is probably not going to put you back into the place where you're the 4-5 seed of the previous year. But I think it's all about steps, and I think it's all about growth, and you want to see the growth of R.J bear because he was a former third overall pick and I forgot to say this early on this is a uh, this is from my guys over in the John Boy Media Talking Baseball podcast you know your favorite team more than I do so there be there might be some Knicks fans that have a different outlook I trust you more than I trust me with the Knicks because again I stopped watching them some time ago let's go out west because this is a team that we mentioned just a little bit earlier um as being another one of the disappointments and that is the Portland Trailblazers now their disappointment basically ended like a month and a half into the season when Dane was going down with his injury and stuff so basically Basically, since then, this is exactly what we expect. They're barely even playing NBA players at this point. We're like the Spurs are in a must-win situation, and they were like, you know what? We we are right with letting Dejounte Murray not play <laughs> because it didn't matter. And they, I think they ended up losing by forty or something like that. Um, the Portland Trailblazers are trying to bottom out as much as as they can. Be I think that they might have the most interesting offseason of all of the thirty teams. The most interesting offseason of all the 30 teams. Because I know as 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 fans of the NBA, of fans of, of guys like Damian Lillard, we want to see Dame finally do it. Request a trade, Dame. You've been there for a decade. We want to see you free. It's not. It's probably not going to happen. So what will the Portland Trailblazers do to try to maximize the last couple years of Dame's prime or whatever it may be? They have so many different avenues that they can go down this offseason that I'm so very curious of what they decide to do and whether or not it'll work. They ended up trading CJ McCollum. That was a big moment for them in the organization. He had been one of the most beloved players since he's been there. But on the bright side of that, you have a guy in Anthony Simons that when Damian Lillard went down, he was incredible. 
He was he was shooting 40% from three. He was playing the pick and roll with Yusuf Nurkic too good, a little bit too good. And he was like, you know what, Ant? We see that you got this little nagging injury. We're going we gonna to let you chill out. We're going we to have Mr. Williams take over the point guard dudes because you are actually trying to win up some games here. We're not trying to do that. The thing that scares me is that they're going to they're gonna go out there, roll the balls out, and say, hey, Dame, Anthony, go do your thing. And that just is that for me, that is just CJ McCullum and Damian Lillard 2.0. What is the ceiling on Anthony Simons? I'm not putting the cap on it because bro looks spectacular. But what I've seen is bro looks spectacular with the ball in his hands. And, 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 when you have Damian Lillard, you probably rather have Damian Lillard with the ball in his hands because he is one of the top players in the league. So now you have Anthony Simons playing more of an off-ball guy or getting the, the touches periodically when in reality he's he's at his best more than just a spot-up shooter. And not to mention one of the things that has been the downfall of that that might be it, of this backcourt between Damian Caesar McCollum is that they didn't defend nobody. And I definitely don't trust a Damian Lillard or Anthony Simons backcourt to get any more stops than I trusted Dame and CJ. So what do you do do you use Anthony Simons as a value because it has grown since we since the rest of the GMs across the league saw that he can actually hoop use that first round pick use whatever assets you have to try to get a disgruntled star to pair him in Portland but then what does that what does that do with the rest of the roster there's so many different avenues and so many tough decisions that this organization has to face and have to decide this this offseason I, I I, I don't envy the guy that has to make those decisions. I'm trying to look at the teams that are on the outside looking in and try to figure out of these teams, which team do I think would make the most, a uh, most significant jump next year? And I guess the easy answer would be the Portland Trailblazers, right? Because Dame will be back to some capacity and they're not going to roll Dame out with the, the bare bones roster they have now. Um, my number two would probably be the Knicks, right? I think those are the easiest answers, but my actual answer is the Orlando Magic. The Orlando Magic right now are tied for the worst record in the entire league at 20 and 58. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say this will be a team next season that is at least competing to be a play-in roster. I know that might be saying a lot, but I, I do really like a lot of the pieces that they have on their team. Since the All-Star break, Wendell Carter has looked like, I'm not going to say a new man because he had been ramping up to this. I think he has increase his points per game every single month this season. And I trust that what Wendell Carter Jr. doing, what he's doing right now is the real deal. They had this spurt um, in the last couple weeks or so where they were one of the, they were the number one defense in the league for like a two week stretch. I think some of those things, now I'm not expecting them to be the number one defense next season, but I think there are little nuggets that they're dropping this season that you can look and say, part of that is real. Franz Wagner was a surprise for me because I don't watch much college ball. He was surprised to me that he was this polished as a rookie. And I remember doing the scouting reports and they were saying, ah, he might struggle to score at the NBA level. He has not. If there's one thing about the Orlando Magic, that they might have too many players that might be worthy of, of PT. And well, you know my answer to something like that. If you got too many players, you got to consolidate and get something better. You know, if you if it's this team that want to get a little bit young and we got a ton of young pick uh, young players, go ahead and make make a move or two. I know that would be pushing the timeline, and they probably won't do that. But that's just my unrealistic mind saying that. Um, eventually you're gonna have Jonathan Isaac play basketball again, and even if Jonathan Isaac is 50% the overall player than he was two years ago, whenever it was, and he got injured, he's still probably gonna be pretty damn elite on the defensive side of the ball. And I guess the real question. Uh, as I as I believe in a lot of the things they could do on the defensive side of the ball next season is like which NBA player, which player on their roster is going to step up on the offensive side of the ball to be the go to scorer? Will it be Cole? Will it be Franz? Will we have a, a decent sophomore season for Jalen Suggs? I feel like they're just playing with house money right now, because even if everything I'm saying right now is false. We'll be right back in the lottery. Oh, and guess what? We got an extra Chicago Bulls pick coming up next season. Um, I think I can objectively look at that trade and say that they walked out of there with a huge W because I think Wendell Carter is going to be one of their building blocks. And they got him on an absolute steal. He signed an extension before the season started or early in the season. And the way he's been playing since the All-Star break, that's an absolute steal. Franz Wagner and the place he was drafted, absolute steal. And they still got another pick in, in the vault from the Bulls, which is amazing. OKC. Okay, 
Thunder decided to shut down everybody as well. Um, and they're sitting at the fourth best odds. They have a 12% chance of getting the first overall pick. The only thing I really want to say about the OKC Thunder is that I'm extremely impressed with, with Trey Mann and how he's been able to play. There was a stretch um, a couple weeks ago, or maybe a week or so ago, where, where Darius Baisley was playing his best basketball of his career. I think it was four straight games where he scored 20-plus points. And then Poku had, I think, four straight games where he scored double-digit points. And he, he had a bucket that almost sent us to overtime, but they ended up losing because that's exactly what they want to do. A couple nights ago, uh, the Detroit Pistons tried to outtake them, and the Detroit Pistons lost. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well. The Detroit Pistons won, which means that they lost in the grand scheme of things. But this is what I want to see from the OKC Thunder. And I don't know how realistic it is for Sam Presti to do something like this. Right now, if I run this sim lottery, they actually fell in this one. They fell in this one. I would love for the OKC Thunder to, to find the player that they absolutely love. This is out of, out of Jaden Ivey. Paolo, Chet, Jabari Smith. This is our. This is the one we absolutely love, and I would love for them to package some things up and get that guy. They have a million first round picks, and I just think it's it's completely unrealistic to use all of those draft picks and expect to build a competent roster just because you're just gonna have too many pieces to develop. Right now, they already have too many. If you ask me. They already got too many pieces to develop. And you're trying to add seven more picks in the next two years to that? Impossible. So if there is a team out there that gets a high pick and, and looking to uh, maybe drop down a little bit to get to get multiple picks, you have to make those moves. I don't know how realistic it is for Sam Presti to do it, but I would love to see it. Even if you miss on the pick, honestly. Just, just assert yourself there. Do it. Or... Use those picks to accelerate the timeline because you actually do have really good players over there in Shea. Josh Giddy was really good in his rookie season. Like I said, Darius Basie was turning a new leaf, and Dort is Dort. So maybe it's not trading up to get a, a top three pick, but maybe it's trading some of those picks to a team that decide to hit the reset button, and now you got a secondary star or a third-tier player on the roster as well. Because eventually, eventually you got to get your average age over 18 years old, right? Houston Rockets, Jalen Green over the past month has been incredible. And I, I like the fact that it is under the radar because I, I want to see him jump onto the scene next season like surprise. Y'all didn't expect me to do this because, well, he was highly, and I guess this is the case for every single high draft pick, which is so stupid to me, how how criticized they are. Same thing with Kay Cunningham in the first month when he couldn't do, he wasn't playing uh, as up to the standards of first overall pick. I hate how criticized these young players are when they go from college or the G League in Jalen Green's case to, to the best basketball league in the world. I mean, I know it happens where people immediately come in and it's, it's great, but it's unlikely even if it is the first overall pick or the second overall pick. So I like that he turned that that leaf. And he was my pick for for um, rookie of the year coming into the season just because I felt like he was going to put up a bunch of points. And it took some time, but he is to that point where he is putting up a bunch. I'm still up in the air about Kevin Porter Jr. as a long-term guy alongside him, but I really love Jalen Green as the piece. Like, I, me and the guys were talking, like, if you were to redraft, do you think the top four picks stay the same? And I believe that the Houston Rockets, even though we still see, we see Scotty Barnes being amazing, we see Evan Mobley being amazing, I still think the Houston Rockets will still take Jalen Green to the number two pick. Because what we've seen over the last two months or the last month is that he, he projects to be a number one go-to scorer, right? Um, so I think the top four picks will probably stay the same if it were to be redrafted. And then after that, you can have a conversation about a couple different guys. But top four is probably solidified. Number one in top four was, the, uh, was Kay Cunningham. And like I mentioned... I mean, he he has ramped it up so much that he's making it a real conversation between him, Scotty, and of course Evan Mobley, who's going to be the rookie of the year, um, because he is a player that generates so many open looks. And I know his counting stats and with the assists don't look too incredible, but when you think about who the hell his teammates are, they are incredible. Eventually, he's going to get shooters around him and people that can finish at the rim, and those assist numbers are gonna are gonna go up. And like I mentioned, I don't know if they have that secondary star on the roster. I don't know if it's gonna be Sadiq or Killian Hayes who had a career night a couple nights ago. I don't know if it's gonna be them. So I'm happy that they're in the position where they are now, where it looks like they're going to have one of the top four picks. 52% chance they get a top four pick. And they can pair K Cunningham with one of these, these draft prospects. If I'm the Wizards, there's no way in hell I give Bradley Beal that super max extension that he's eligible for. 
I love Bradley Beal. He's one of he's one of um the, my most favorite shot creators to watch because he's so silky smooth and he can get his shot shot off at any time. I'm not giving him the biggest contract in NBA history. I'm sorry. I think they will, uh, because. They don't have any other choice. They had their choice to potentially trade him at the deadline, decided not to. And I know he was dealing with some stuff around the deadline. But listen, he's Bradley He's Bradley Beal. If he was dealing with a hamstring at the deadline, there were still going to be teams out there that were willing to trade for him. And maybe that doesn't give you your full value. But regardless, he wants that max contract. And I don't blame him. If, if I had an opportunity to set my family up with 200 AMs, why would I not do that? But if I'm looking at the overall outlook for the Washington Wizards and their organization, giving Bradley Beal that type of money, just pigeonholes us to a playoff team, and and maybe, and I'm, at, I'm like maybe a playoff team, um, and I and I know there are some organizations and owners that are a okay with just being a playoff team, but but you got you got to think bigger picture, you got to think bigger picture, and they did the Porzingis deal, and they're telling Bradley, hey, listen, we we trying to continue to build around you and get better, and and Porzingis has been solid since he's been over there, but I, I think we all understand his limitations as a player. The Sacramento Kings. Shout out to Off Night because he's making at least them somewhat watchable in the last. Hey, listen, when you when you're rebuilding a team, you gotta figure out that one thing to attach yourself to when you're watching those games and watching Davion Mitchell progress as a as a primary ball handler since the air and it's a bonus are out for the rest of the season. To watch him develop as a primary ball handler and and continue to try to lock up opposing guards is something you should attach yourself to 100. I am a I'm a bit decent amount optimistic about them potentially fighting for a play-in spot i guess technically right now you could classify them as fighter for a play-in spot because they're not officially eliminated um but next season when you look at the numbers between De'Aaron fox and sabonis in that little amount of time i think it's 340 minutes exactly they played together since the all-star break or since the trade deadline the numbers aren't terrible they're not great but they're better than any other two-man lineup that they ran this season and that's that's a reason for optimism as again, they're still missing a bunch of shooting because they're going to need shooting when you have De'Aaron Fox as a bonus. But if they can surround them with decent shooting, league average shooting, slightly above league average shooting, I think this offense can be pretty good. Don't ask me about the defense. I think there's still, still going to be struggles there. But if they can just get some solid shooters around them this offseason, I think it can be a legit league pass team. And then the last team to talk about, if I'm not mistaken, is the Indiana Pacers who made the trade to, to get Sabonis out and got Tyrese Halliburton in. And Tyrese Halliburton has, uh, is, has always been an up-and-down player in the sense that some games you get him to, to have the 30-point game like he hit, had against the, uh, the, the Boston Celtics a couple nights ago. And some games he has four because he wants to take two shots. His aggression... It's something that he's still trying to figure out, and it, he, he he's young, right? He's a young player in his NBA career, and I think he will figure it out eventually. But I'm, I think that they're looking at all the things they had, and there's some people there that they're they're pretty good, they feel pretty good about, right? I don't want to put them on this level, obviously, because Robert Williams is one of the better defender defensive centers in the entire NBA. But Robert Williams struggled with staying on the floor because of foul trouble in his very early stage of his NBA career. Uh, Ijax can go through the same thing, just be a smarter defender and not just so block happy because blocks look good on stat sheets and block blocks look good and highlight reels once he figured that out i think he's gonna be solid and you know even though right now they're going on a little tank slash retool rebuilding they still have players here that that you really trust um, malcolm brogdon is a player that you're gonna trust um they have buddy hill now after the trade and then you still have miles and tj warren coming back eventually nope tj warren is a free agent this season so you still have miles here and you got tj mcconnell coming back next season so this can be a team that can you know be an average team next season if they want it to be i know man i stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit i'm um, talking about some teams i have not watched in some time like i said you know your team better than i do so if i misspoke or you disagree with something i said completely okay man today we got a great slate of games so hopefully you get some time to watch some basketball but if you don't the enjoy basketball newsletter got you you know what i'm saying got, got you bro so hit that link in the description man uh and i'm just gonna remind you to enjoy ball